Welcome to the Freedom School, an opportunity to learn about history-bending campaigns and initiatives from across the globe. We are inspired by what the Freedom Schools meant during the Civil Rights Movement in the United States, a place for alternative learning for African Americans, a safe space to discover suppressed stories of courage under oppression, the wisdom of culture, and the determination of many to make the impossible seem inevitable. This Freedom School is part of Spadework, a program that seeks to nurture and develop a new generation of organizers committed to those same principles. Learning about the historical context of these important campaigns and movement initiatives allows us to reflect more deeply about our own current challenges. Inquiring and learning is part of the organizer's spade work. Organizers are inspired by the people we meet and the stories we share with each other. We also know that this journey never ends, and along the way we find joy and satisfaction in practicing the proven organizing adage. Listen with an open heart to the lessons others have learned and apply what you think makes sense. Then reflect, rinse, repeat. If you are inspired by what you hear, or if you want to support the development of a new generation of organizers through spade work, then consider making a small contribution to keep this going. Go to www.spadework.school backslash donate right now, or simply click on the link on the chat screen. Enjoy your time together. Adelante. Welcome. Uh, today is our 10th and final session of Freedom School. Uh, so welcome. My name is Alex Muhammad and I am born and raised in Chicago. I currently work as the political training director for the Mass Liberation Project. In this space, I'll be serving as co-host for our Freedom School. For the past 10 weeks in Freedom School, we've been having weekly conversations with movement leaders from across the globe to reflect, learn, and pull lessons from history changing campaigns and organizing strategies of the past. Connected to Freedom School, we launched Spade Work, which is an eight month intensive campaign development and training support cohort for organizations and organizers on the front lines responding to systemic racism. We're really excited to be here and welcome again to our final Freedom School. I'm gonna pass it over to my co-host, Larry. Thank you, Alex. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Good morning, good afternoon, especially good afternoon to our to our guests um, out there in the way out there in the East Coast. Um, my name is Larry Solomon. I teach in the historic College of Ethnic Studies at San Francisco State University. Longtime teacher there. Um, also have some experience teaching movement history and doing trainings like this. The Freedom School, as Alex said, is uh, what we've been doing for the last. 10 weeks, um, not so much as an academic exercise, but as a, as a crucial part of, in the, the crucial part in the training of, of, uh, of new organizers. Um, I just real quick about the idea behind Freedom School is not just to lift up these lessons that sometimes have been buried in, in history, but also to provide some inspiration. So both as a substantive history, but also as a way to inspire current and future action. Um, both of those ideas will be in, in, in great supply today in the session we're going to bring you. Quick a couple of programming notes um, I can get out the way. We are live streaming on YouTube. Uh, we also have a, a great YouTube page that has archived our previous nine episodes. So you can find that by looking at Spade Work Freedom School on YouTube and you'll find our, our channel. Um, we're devoting a pretty good portion of the second half of today's conversation to your questions and comments. So use that chat function as much as you'd like. We will do our best. Our team here at Freedom School will sort through those questions. We'll do our best to give them the, the light of day. I'm going to ask Alex to begin to introduce our session today. Alex. Yep. Um, today we are honored to bring you the history and the story of SNCC um, and their 1964 campaign known as Freedom Summer 
This historic campaign centered around several goals, including to establish freedom schools and community centers throughout the state of Mississippi, to increase black voter registration, and to ultimately challenge the state at the Democratic National Convention that year. Right. And, you know, it's also, this is such an important case study in the power of deep grassroots organizing against and amidst the most challenging, dangerous circumstances and the most entrenched state where white supremacy was uh, was seemingly intractable. Uh, the story we're going to hear today is a significant part of movement history for a reason. And I'm so excited today because we brought together two really wonderful guests to help us better understand that story by offering some context, but telling the story of, of what happened and um, and also kind of lifting up what they see as, as some key lessons. And uh, without further ado, I'm gonna ask Alex to introduce one of our guests. Yes, um, so one of our guests today, we have Dr. Gwendolyn Zahara Simmons. Um, uh, Dr. Simmons became an active uh, became active in the civil rights movement during her freshman year at Spelman in Atlanta, Georgia in 1962. She became a field secretary with the SNCC um, two years later in that summer of 1964 when she joined hundreds of others college, uh, other college age volunteers who traveled to Mississippi to work in their Mississippi Freedom Summer project. She was assigned to Laurel, Mississippi, where she became one of three women project directors in the state, working there for a total of 18 months. Later, Dr. Simmons helped form the Atlantic Project of SNCC, which became the organization's first major Southern urban project. It was in Atlanta, um, it was in the Atlanta project that the foundation for the Black Power thrust into SNCC was laid when the group wrote a position paper on Black Power that would later be published in the New York Times and labeled as SNCC Black Power Manifesto. Dr. Simmons is a retired professor, um, emirate in African American and Religious Studies, and affiliated uh, faculty in the Women's Studies in the University of Florida. She earned her PhD in Islamic Studies from the Temple University in Philadelphia. Her doctoral focus was on Islam Islamic law and its impact on Muslim women. She conducted research for two years in Jordan, Egypt, Palestine, and um, Syria on Sharia's impact in women's and women's movement in those countries to change these laws. She has written many articles and taught many courses on the civil rights movement and on women and Islam. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Simmons. I know that today you're calling us from Gainesville, Florida, um, but a lot of our story in the conversation is going to take place around your time in Mississippi. Um, so I would love for you to share, uh, you know, a little bit about how you ended up in Mississippi. Thank you so very much for inviting me uh, to be a part of your Freedom School. Um, I grew up in the Jim Crow era uh, in Memphis, Tennessee, and uh, you know had lived all my life under the indignities of the Jim Crow system. Uh, when I went away to college. Uh, interestingly, you know, the civil rights movement was booming. Uh, and my grandmother and mother and stepdad who drove me from Mem uh, Memphis to Atlanta, one of the things my grandmother made me promise was that I was not going to get involved in the civil rights movement. And, you know, I promised her and I really meant it. Uh, I was the first person in my family to go to college and I was so excited, you know, to be going to Spelman, which had been my first choice. So I get there and of course, uh, the civil rights movement is in full swing, the student movement, uh, the SNCC headquarters was just about two and a half blocks from the Atlanta University complex of which Spelman was a part. Uh, also the SCLC had its headquarters there and uh, without planning to, but again, under direct orders uh, from my grandmother to join a church, I joined 
one that was very close to the campus. Uh, and I had no idea who Ralph David Abernathy was, who was the pastor of the West Hunter Street Baptist Church. So uh, in that church, I began hearing every Sunday, uh, you know, about the movement and how we all had to get involved, et cetera. Uh, also on campus, uh, without knowing who he was, I had signed up for a class with uh, Dr. Stoughton Lynn, a Yale uh, graduate professor of history. And in that class, I began learning the history I had never been taught about the struggle that Black people had been engaged in since being brought here in chains. So, you know, this was on, you know, kind of making me feel differently about this promise I'd made to my grandmother. Uh, and then the third thing was that every day SNCC workers were on campus uh, trolling, lobbying, you know, really getting on us about joining a demonstration, et cetera, et cetera. So I had these three factors, uh, you know, impacting on me. And after a while, I just, you know, could not not go on a demonstration. Uh, and of course, the Spelman College was very opposed to our being involved. So that was a threat hanging over my head, not only my grandmother's threat, but the school that told us if we you know, got involved uh, that we could lose our scholarship. Well, that was terrifying. Nonetheless, I did get involved. Uh, and once I got involved, I got deeply involved and I started hearing about the plan uh, in my sophomore year uh, for Mississippi Freedom Summer. And uh, another professor who had a profound impact on me uh, was uh, Howard Zinn, who also taught at Spelman, and Vincent Harding, who he and his wife uh, were living in Atlanta and were the directors of the Mennonite House that became one of my favorite hangouts. So I was getting it from every side and I decided I wanted to go to Mississippi for the project and I wanted to be a freedom school teacher. Now I was real clear that there was no way that my grandmother was gonna let me go. So my plan had been to just not go home at the end of uh, the spring semester and just uh, you know stay in Atlanta until it was time to go to the orientation. Uh, plans backfired. Somehow my, uh, the school found out my plan. They alerted my grandmother and she alerted my mother and father and here they came to drag me back home. So with some difficulty, I got back to Atlanta so that I could drive with uh, uh, Stoughton Lynn and all of our Freedom School curriculum booklets to the orientation in um, Oxford, Ohio, where all uh, 800 plus volunteers over two uh, full weeks attended an orientation session. So I, 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 that's how I really got involved. Uh, I was drawn into the movement and I felt that what was going to happen in Mississippi was something I wanted to be a part of, that it was history making. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing. I'm gonna pass it over to you, Larry, to introduce our second guest. Thank you, Alex. I always pretend to teach, pretend to know something about this history when I teach it in my classes, um, but we're lucky today to have the, uh, the foremost historian and scholar on, on Mississippi and SNCC in particular. Um, let me introduce Dr. Charles Payne, who is the Henry Rutgers Distinguished Professor of African American Studies at Rutgers University, Newark, where he also directs the Joseph, Joseph Cornwall Center for Metropolitan Research. Dr. Payne's interests include urban education and school reform, social inequality, social change, and modern African American history. His books, and I think his most recent book is So Much Reform, So Little Change, which examines persistence of failure 
in urban schools. Uh, Dr. Payne is also among the founders of the Education for Liberation Network, which encourages the development of educational initiatives, which encourage then young people to think critically about social issues and understand their own capacity for addressing them. Uh, Professor Payne has taught at and won boatloads of teaching awards at Southern University, Williams College, Haverford College, Northwestern, uh, Duke University, and the University of Chicago. He is the co-author of Debating the Civil Rights Movement, co-editor of Time Longer Than a Rope, A Century of African-American Activism, and uh, for my money, the greatest book on the, on the civil rights movement, and especially on the organizing tradition. You all should pick this book up, order it, order 20 copies. We use it in all our classes at San Francisco State. His book, I've Got the Light of Freedom, The Organizing Tradition in the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement is a classic. Um, it's so good to have both Dr. Simmons and Dr. Charles Payne with us here today. Um, Dr. Payne, can you tell us first where you're calling us from today? Uh, I'm in New Jersey, so, oops, Southern New Jersey. Okay, great, great. Well, uh, you just heard Dr. Simmons there get into a little bit of her motivation uh, to be involved in, in Freedom Summer. I'm hoping you can take us back a little bit first and set some context before 1964, in particular in the activism around Mississippi, um, how dangerous it was, what was at stake. Just a, a few minutes, five minutes, maybe some context, and then we will probably throw it over to a video. But um, I'm gonna leave, open the floor to you, Dr. Payne. Okay, I think that's fine. Um, before I start talking about the history, let me just um, note that I, I'm gonna ask Zahara to go back and say something about her experience with Jimmy Garrett and how that connects to your history at San Francisco State. Um, but also I, I, I want to emphasize that when she defied her family to go to Mississippi, her grandmother told her to never come home again. Right? Yeah. That says something about how, how scared parents and communities were, uh, black or white, north or south, when they saw their children heading into the cauldron. Right? Uh, you can imagine what, it's, what it takes for, for a parent or grandparent to say that. Anyway, she may want to comment further on that. So let me let me try to do in five minutes. So <laughs> I hope I can do this in five, five. I tried to tell Possible. I know, I know, impossible. Yeah, I'll come as close as I can. I'm gonna, if you want to talk about the roots of the movement, Mississippi, you could start with the sharecropping organizing that took place in the depression. Let's put that to the side. For purposes of convenience, let's say that the modern movement starts in 1940, right? Reason I would pick, in the 40s, reason I would pick the 40s is because the proportion, these are all rough figures, but the proportion of Blacks voting in Mississippi in 1900, the turn of the 20th century, is about 3%. In 1940, it's still 3%, right? I mean, there's no change. 1947, it's 12%. 1950, it's, it's 20%. It's going to go down in the 50s, right? But the point, the, the first time the disenfranchisement, wholesale disenfranchisement of the African-American population begins to change. It's clearly in the 1940s, right? And the leadership coming out of that movement has significant impact on the leadership of the movement of the 50s and the 60s. So they're clear organizational and human linkages. Um, a lot of that had to do with the 88,000 black men who went to World War II and came back feeling that they were entitled to some of the democracy they had been fighting for. Some of it had to do with the 1940, I'm sorry, I should be speaking more slowly. The 1944 Supreme Court decision, which outlawed the white primary, which had been one of the primary tools in Mississippi and elsewhere for disenfranchising African-Americans. The late 1940s and the early 1950s, according to numerous activists in Mississippi, were not terribly repressive by Mississippi standards, right? That is, there was not as much killing as there had been in the past, not, not the wholesale firing of people from their jobs. That ended, and so people made some progress on voting rights, some progress on boycotts for economic justice. That ended like that with Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. The white supremacists saw the threat, they organized, uh, and they came down hard. Right. If you went to register to vote, your, your name and address would be published in the paper, I think it was for two weeks. You were likely to get fired for your job. You had crops in the ground, nobody would buy them, couldn't get insurance, and a doctor would see you. If you had a mortgage, your bank was likely to foreclose. And if that didn't, if you can get the message, right, then you could be bombed. You could be, you, 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 your place could be burned. 
um, and finally you could be killed. In 1955, the Klan started the year in Mississippi with eight people on its death list. These people will not live the year, they said. And by the end of that year, uh, at least five of those people uh, had been killed, had been bombed, or had dri been driven out of the state, right? So it was a very, very, it was a murderous and dangerous decade. And the people, I, I want to emphasize, the people who are paying the greatest price for change are poor people at the bottom of the social order, right? They're the ones who are getting hammered, right? And a movement that is not even a movement in the eyes of the rest of the nation, because it appears no one, no one's, no one's, the civil rights movement hasn't started yet, <laughs> right? In the eyes of, in the eyes of most of the country. At the same time, the violence was no longer enough to simply stop movements, which had been the case in the 1930s. You could stop movements with violence in the 1930s. In the 1950s, and I think Charlie Cobb, uh, one of Zahara's comrades, would say part of the difference in the 1950s is blacks were shooting back. Right, that the, there's the NAACP leadership in, in Mississippi. They were they were armed like Marines, right? Um, Angie Moore's house in Cleveland, Mississippi, was was described as an armed camp. E. W. Steptoe Bob said he never went any place without a gun, right? Um, these were people who were com staunchly committed to the ideals of self-defense, and so the white racists had a whole new factor to consider right now. You can shoot, but you will be shot back at. That's one one difference, and the federal government is playing a tiny tiny role. Right, of, 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 of visibility, uh, that made, made, made some difference as well, I suspect. Um, black colleges were, were incredibly important in, in that period. Um, I, I would say that the period from 1961 to 64 is a separate kind of a period, right? A couple of things start happening. The black colleges students like Sahara, many of whom called themselves the Emmett Till generation, people who had been mobilized and activated and inspired and anchored by, by the murder of Emmett Till in 1955. They are now in college. They are being brought together on, on, on black college campuses, which serve to um, um, inculcate, I'm not sure what, what, what I want, but which serve to nurture their, their burgeoning, emerging political consciousness and create so a set of protective relationships. This period is for me marked by two deaths. The death of, of, of Herbert Lee in, in southwest of Mississippi in 1961, when the movement takes its first serious voter registration drives, and, and that of uh, Lewis Allen, 1964, who had been a witness to the Herbert Lee killing. So these, these, killings, these, these killings are linked. In between that period, what the movement learned is that you could go into a Mississippi community you could right away find young people who were, who, who were willing to work with you. You could right away find some adults. They tended not to be preachers, right? They tended not to be, uh, they actually tended not to be the poorest of the poor, but they tended to be, to be folk, um, they tended disproportionately to be women. They tended disproportionately to be folk who owned their own land or folk who had some kind of economic independence, whether they owned a beauty shop or they were bootleggers, right? People who had economic independence were more likely to join the movement when the movement was in its most desperate, its desperate phase. And what the movement had learned by 1963 is that in these communities which were under so much threat, you could nonetheless generate movement. You could generate, you could have long lines of people standing at, 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 at the voter registration office. You could not get them registered in any numbers that meant anything. And you could not keep them from being killed periodically, right? And, and the idea of Freedom Summer is, is largely, how do we protect our people? All right, so I, I'll stop there and uh, we, we can pick it up wherever you like. So thank you for that context. That's such important context. And I know there's like a great many details and a great many important names, heroic figures um, that, that we could get into and certainly that are described in your book. Um, but I, I, I just want to emphasize that point again, that, you know, a lot of times the popular understanding of these movements, <clears throat> you know, the sit-ins kind of spark everything or create everything or Rosa Parks refuses to give up, but there's so much that's done before to sort of anchor what happens later to cultivate 
you know, the, the generation of, of fighters, but also to, to anchor the movement. Um, so it gets away from this myth of the movements happen spontaneously. Uh, I really appreciate that, that history. Um, I think Alex has a description or introduction to the film clip that we're about to see. So uh, Matt, if you can get ready to put that clip on, but Alex, you want to explain the, what we're about to watch? Yep, I sure will. Um, so what we're about to see is a brief segment from the film Freedom on My Mind. This piece opens up with the legendary organizer, Bob Moses, describing the importance of local leaders like Fannie Lou Hamer. In this video, you'll also hear from local Mississippi folks who became hugely important leaders and organizers in their own right. Um, and then on the other side of that clip, we'll open it back up to conversation between Dr. Simmons and Dr. Payne. There was this wonderful woman on the bus there who sang every church song that you can imagine and she really sort of lit up the bus with her spirit. Who's our mama in the movement? I mean, she was like, she represented that spirit for us. We were all children. And she was one of those who came forward and to tell us something. You can pray until you faint. But if you don't get up and try to do something, God is not going to put it in your lap. Fannie Lou Hamer had been a plantation timekeeper for 18 years. The day she registered to vote, she was fired and evicted. She joined SNCC as a full-time field secretary and became a powerful voice in the civil rights movement. Mrs. Hamer was an inspiration, I think, to everyone. She really represented what everyone was trying to organize for and struggle for, which was the transformation from the bottom of the society, the people who were sharecroppers living on those plantations, the promise of their being able to find their inner spirit and energy and put that to the service of a great social movement. And Mrs. Hamer, more than anyone else, came to symbolize that transformation. You see, we are human beings, and we are not stopping now till we get something that's better. We worked all these years for nothing. Women have gone to the field and worked from 10 to 12 hours for $3 a day. And I know what it is to suffer, and I know what it is to be hungry, and we are not going to stop. Even if I have to give my life, it will make it better for some child. So the excitement was, was, was this feeling of camaraderie, this knowing that you had somebody with you that who was putting their life on the line just like you, and the belief that you were invincible, the belief that your cause was right. All of a sudden, for the first time in my life, I'm accepted. I'm part of the family, I'm part of the community, I'm treated as an equal, I'm treated as somebody who can be listened to, who have ideas, who have something to contribute. The movement was the beginning of me finding myself. I felt that the movement is the greatest thing I've ever seen. And I had a respect for people who started taking a stand and made me feel good. And people started looking at me. Well, I would feel so proud when I would go to Tougaloo and I slept in Ann Moody's room. You know, I would feel like, well, one day I'm going to be this great. I'm going to be in college, you know? I wanted to be like them. I wanted to sound like them. I wanted to understand what the movement was about. This is an announcement. We will ask you first what your intentions are. We are going to the courthouse to register Chief Larry was looked on with all, because, simply because he was the chief of police and he had the last word on everything. And as usual, somebody pushed me forward. 
I saw the look on his face. He is Isle of Maid's girl up here. He was just stunned. He didn't know what to do. And for the first time in my life, I saw indecision in Chief Larry's face. And that made me feel so proud. People started looking up into my face, into my eyes, say, that cat is sure enough tough, isn't it? I wasn't so tough, I was scared on every march, but I knew that I couldn't turn back. Something would, just wouldn't let me turn back. It was so beautiful to see people like Miss Lula Bell Johnson and uh, Miss McGee. They would be walking with pride and their titties would be sticking out a whole long way in front of them. Mama said you could see their titties a block before you see them. But they'd be walking with such pride, and they'd be marching. And, and I remember myself trying to walk with that heavy step that they used. Look like the earth would catch their feet and hold them. For the time. But these women would walk that walk, you know, and then when they when they get up and they see the, the human barricade of police, they start talking that talk and singing them songs and saying, I ain't scared of your jail cause I want my freedom. I ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. I'm gonna keep on marching. Well, I found out that I could do it. I didn't think of it so much about dying, about how you're going to die. What the, the thing was, how you're going to live, right? Bob was so gentle and so kind. You couldn't ask for anybody better. He planned strategy. He got people out of jail. He calmed nerves. He soothed feelings. He made everybody feel like they had a part to play. I remember one time he pointed at me, he said, now, Ida, now you've been to jail before. You know how to go to jail. And I was glad to say, yes, Bob, I do know. I was glad to be used for something. Whereas the whole town, to me, was looking down his nose at me. The movement said to me, I was somebody. I was somebody, they said. The movement exposed you to people who live differently. I exposed you to ideas and interests and, and concerns, and for the first time, uh, introduced the possibility of a different life than just picking and shopping cotton. It unleashed yearnings uh, in me. I felt like I had come home. All of my life I had felt kind of odd. The way I thought, the way I felt, the things that I was willing to do, and then here were some people who talked my language, who apparently thought the way I did, and were willing to, willing to take risk. And I just felt like, ha, oh, finally. I went looking for Martin Luther King's brother to find my heroes in the movement. And in addition to that, I find also a family setting. I, I mean, this was a, it's a turning point in my life. I was in heaven for a minute. So that's a powerful, powerful uh, set of recollections there. Curtis Hayes, at the end there, when he was referring to Martin Luther King's brother, was told by some local folks that Martin Luther King's brother was in town, ended up going to a church meeting. And it wasn't Martin Luther King's brother, it was Bob Moses, um, who had already been organizing for, for a time in Mississippi. And so this is just, you know, transformative in so many ways you heard that. I'm, I'm going to um, hand it over to, to Dr. Payne and Dr. Simmons, who are going to be in conversation with one another right now. Um, but first, I, I sort of want both of your reflections on what you just saw. And then, you know, the floor is, the floor is all yours. Dr. Payne. No, Zahara, would you start the reflections? 
Uh, certainly, uh, boy, I tell you, you know, given that I knew and worked with everybody in this documentary, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of trying not to start crying here. Um, this, you know, this is how it was. Uh, and I know that I felt similarly about the movement and it was, you know, those of us who were in the movement and all of those who joined, we called ourselves, and you know, we use sexist language then, but a band of brothers and a circle of trust. So of course now a band of brothers and sisters uh, and a circle of trust. Uh, but, you know, these were people that you had united with who you knew you might die with. Uh, and so the incredible spirit uh, and camaraderie uh, that we had with one another as we, you know, face death, I mean, you know, and I'm gonna be real honest, I was scared. I mean, no question about it. And um, I was so glad that uh, Dr. Payne shared a wonderful piece that Vincent Harding wrote uh, and delivered to us at the orientation about the singing. Uh, because I know the more frightened I was, the louder I sang. Uh, so, and he talks about how when we say, I ain't scared of your jails, we were scared of their jails. But in spite of that, we were going to keep on walking, keep on talking, and going to jail uh, because it was so necessary. So, I'm so glad to be reminded of this film. Uh, and it is a wonderful testament to the spirit that uh, motivated everyone who was in the movement. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that with our audience. I, 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 my reaction would, would be very similar. I think I would add that uh, Ida Mae Holland, the young woman, uh, had, mm -hmm. had been raped as a child, or maybe she was a teenager. I'm not, I'm not, I don't remember exactly. Uh, she became a prostitute as a teenager. So when she says the whole community looked down on me, she meant exactly that, right? Came from one of the poorest families in a very, very poor town, right? And so the, the, the and, and, and the most dramatic way, the, the movement was for her an opportunity to create a new respected identity. Um, but I think it, it was that way in different ways for so many other folk. Folk found their best selves in that movement, right? Uh, they mm -hmm. found the version of themselves that after the movement was long gone and that self was long gone, I think folks spent the rest of their life trying to go back to that, what they were then and there, but it required that community, right? And I think, and this is maybe something we can talk about or wonder about or explore with the audience, the capacity to sustain community in, in the course of struggle. I don't know that that's one of the things we understand yet. The, the other thing is that clear focus on democracy, right? That we're going to have sharecroppers and chambermaids who are going to shape this country. Um, there are some sections at the end on the Atlantic City Convention. And Bob says, you could see people who had never been in a voting booth learning democracy, right? Right at its heart. But he, they just had this faith, right? And, and, and a vigorous democratic ideal, right? And so again, in terms of the big imponderable questions, how, where do we find that? How, how does that faith in the movement, I'm, I'm, I'm stealing words from Seth McClark right now, the movement's ultimate objective is to create the army of democracy, right? Um, and that phrase, and, you know, I think Schnick was closer to that than anybody else. And that phrase has a real particular kind of resonance in our time. Right? So anyway, I'll stop there. Well, what I'd like to do is, is maybe start where we left off with Dr. Simmons when you leave Spelman and you go to Oxford, Ohio for this orientation, the SNCC orientation training where all these Freedom Summer volunteers 
and leaders are, are joining together. Um, I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about that experience. Mm -hmm. And again, I love that point that uh, both Ida Mae Holland makes in the film and that you just made about being afraid and doing it anyway, right? That's the definition mm -hmm. of courage. Um, but I, I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about that SNCC orientation and then mm -hmm. both you and Dr. Payne can be in conversation with one another. Uh, certainly. Um, I, I thank uh, uh, my dear brother Charles for bringing up the fact that when I left home to go to Atlanta and, you know, it took quite some doing, SNCC had to send um, a money order for me to be able to uh, take the Greyhound from Memphis and my grandmother intercepted it and tore it up uh, because let me just say, my grandmother had been raised by her grandmother who was an enslaved person. And I had learned all my life about slavery and uh, my grandma Lucy. And I had heard all my life that the worst place in the world, according to my grandmother, for a black person was Mississippi. So, you know, I didn't, I wasn't going with uh, starry eyes. I mean, I had been told that Mississippi was a hell hole and if nobody in their right mind should go and everybody there needed to leave. So for my grandmother to hear that I was planning to go to Mississippi to work on voter registration, uh, she said, well, that's a death sentence. How are you out of your mind? And that, that anybody who could talk you into that didn't mean you any good. So for her, SNCC was bad news. <laughs> but anyway, um, the uh, Jim Foreman, who was the executive secretary of SNCC, who was one of my early mentors and idols, uh, you know, I called him back and said, my grandmother tore up the money order. You got to send it to a girlfriend's house in her name so she can buy my ticket uh, to, to take the bus. But anyway, uh, as I mentioned, uh, I, cr I didn't mention, but my grandmother said, if you leave, don't ever come back. And so I cried all the way to Atlanta uh, because, you know, it was like I was going into the unknown and leaving my family, which had been a loving family. I mean, so it was, it was not easy to uh, have my grandmother, who I loved, who had raised me from the time I was three, to say, if you leave, don't ever come back. And she was the kind of person who, when she told you something, she meant it. So for me, that meant I had lost my home. But anyway, um, when I got to Atlanta, there was Stoughton and Alice Lynn and their two little kids welcoming me at the bus station. And as I mentioned, I'd been crying the whole way and they took me home and began to say, you got a new family, you know, we're your family, SNCC's your family. And so, you know, I was trying to make my peace with that. Uh, the orientation was an incredible experience. Uh, there were 800 plus, I think 900 really divided into two groupings and uh, most of them were white young people, college age and mostly college from all over the country. And that was a, an incredible gathering. One of the things that the leaders, you know, the people making the presentations and all had to uh, convince them that, you know, we're going into a dangerous situation because many of them, you know, when we'd sit around the campfire at night uh, you know, singing and, and, and uh, you know, roasting marshmallows, et cetera. I knew that these kids did not know uh, where we were going. And I was personally trying to say, look, we could get killed down here. This is no joke. And of course they didn't believe it. Why would they? They were white, upper middle-class, middle-class Americans. They didn't believe it. The other thing was that one of the reasons that I thought I might not get killed was because so many whites were going. And I was like, 
I don't think they're going to kill up a whole bunch of white people down here. Somebody's going to do something. So it was interesting when I was called in to be told my assignment. And I went there, I remind you, to be a freedom school teacher. And I had worked with Stoughton Lynn uh, on the curriculum uh, as a student of his uh, in, in the class I took with him as an independent study, et cetera. And so uh, I, that was where my heart was to be a freedom school teacher. So when they called me in uh, and they called Jimmy Garrett in, many of you know who he is. Jimmy was uh, from LA and uh, there was another person, I'm um, blanking on his name at the moment. I'm sure it'll come back to me. We were told that we were going to be the staff for Laurel. So two black men and me. And I was like, well, wait a minute, uh, just us? And they said, yes, uh, Laurel is too dangerous to send any whites into. And I was like, well, wait a minute. I thought that was the whole <laughs> idea. <laughs> you mean you sending three black people in there? And they were like, yeah, because you know, you can kind of blend in. Uh, and I'm like, I've never been there before in my life. I don't I never even heard of the place. So <laughs> what do you mean blend in? But anyway, the, the orientation, uh, because SNCC put me on payroll because I showed up penniless. I think I might've had $5 to my name. Uh, so I was put on SNCC payroll and became, unlike you know the volunteers uh, who all had to bring their own money, et cetera. And so therefore I spent two weeks, the full two weeks at the orientation. This, this, you know, we had been uh, hearing all these wonderful uh, uh, lectures, and you know, it was an incredible thing. But as I said, I knew a lot of these young people went were going thinking that this was a piece of cake. By the second week, um, Cheney, Goodman, and Schwerner had disappeared. And so we were called in for a plenary session uh, and uh, Vincent Harding, Bob Moses, Jim Foreman and others were on the stage looking exceedingly glum. And it was uh, not on our printed program that we were gonna have this plenary. And of course they had called us all in to tell us that these three uh, persons who knew, you know, Cheney was from the area. Uh, Schwerner had already worked there for over a year or more. Uh, and I had met um, Goodman and waved him off on the bus that was going down, taking a number of the uh, volunteers. So we were told that they not only had disappeared, but it was very clear that they were dead. Well, the hush that went over the auditorium of some 500 of us uh, was palpable. And I can tell you, everybody got serious about the security measures that were being put in place to try to keep uh, the volunteers as well as the families that were taking us in alive. Uh, so it was an incredible uh, uh, training, a wonderful coming together of all of these people, but it was heavy duty, particularly in that second week. Uh, I drove in a car, Lester McKinney, I'm so sorry, I was blanking on his name, Lester McKinney, who was going to be the project director. He was a seasoned SNCC organizer. He had been to Laurel, he had done the scouting, uh, but even though he had been to Laurel, he had not been able to get housing for us. So the three of us drove from Oxford to Hattiesburg so that we would have somewhere to stay. And then we would drive the 30 miles north to Laurel to try to find housing and to set up a project. So there wasn't even a project 
in Laurel. And you can imagine how shocked that was uh, to find out that we were totally breaking ground in Laurel. Uh, so let's see if, if uh, Charles, you wanna say anything on this issue. Sorry, I, was, I think I was muted. I wanna back up and, and, and talk about SNCC's learning process and about the dilemma of organizing that, that lay behind that lay behind the arguments inside SNCC. Um, go back to the fall of 1963. SNCC was doing something called the Freedom Vote. And in the context of the Freedom Vote, they noted that when white college student volunteers from the North were engaged in something, they got a whole different level of national attention, right? Mm -hmm. The press just followed those kids all around, throwing microphones. What do you think about Laurel, Mississippi? Where, well, that's, they weren't there, but yeah. <laughs> wherever they were. Um, yeah. And I did the press, but when those white kids came, the FBI started to hang around to see what, to make sure the white kids were okay, right? Exactly. It, it, it was just a very, very clear demonstration of how the, the, the nation was invested differently yes. when lies of privileged, these were kids, I think, Stanford and Yale were, were the yes. first ones. My yes. memory is right, right. Yes, yes. When the lives of privileged white Americans are placed in jeopardy, the nation moves, right? Exactly. In a way, it had not been moving when black people were being killed over the previous, we're going to say in the case of SNCC, three to four years, right? We right. could take it long, take it back a whole lot further than that. But right. just in terms of the this, this SNCC leadership. And, and I think that killing of Lewis Allen, right, had just enormous impact on the SNCC leadership. If you're Bob Moses, you have to feel that you are responsible, right? If you're Dave Dennis, who was leading court at the time, you have to feel you are responsible for that death, right? Right. And so on the one hand, that leadership feels we have to do something to take the guns out of the hands of racists, right? Mm -hmm. On the other hand, and this is the part I want you to comment on, Zahara, so far as I know, the experienced leaders inside SNCC at that time, the, 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 the veteran organizers, almost to a person, right, were opposed to having hordes of outside volunteers come in, right? And, 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 and it would be right that in a complicated way, they were opposed to having hordes of white outside volunteers come in. I don't know how happy they would have been <laughs> with outsiders of any color though, right? I mean, and partly what their argument was, we have begun to develop leadership in these communities. We have people in these communities who are taking responsibility for things they never took responsibility for, for before. If you bring in a whole lot of aggressive, well-educated, highly verbal, mm -hmm. think, uh, I'm going too far. <laughs> I thought they think they know everything in the world, but that's how we reproduce college students out of these so-called elite schools, right? they are going to push the people we have been developing back into the shadows, right? Mm -hmm. On, onto the sidelines, right? Uh, your friend Hollis Watkins, I have heard him say over a period of maybe the 40 years I have known him, that that summer pushed back our organizing 90 years. That's the number he always uses, right? So mm -hmm. I just want you to comment on this, right? That, that on the one hand, leadership feels it's necessary, tactically, strategically, I guess. It's the big picture, right? Mm -hmm. Stopping violence. And on the other hand, the organizers on the ground felt that it was not going to help organizing, it was going to hurt organizing. Uh, you know, and it's, it's clearly that was the case. Now, you know, because I was not a local Mississippi organizer, I wasn't privy to a lot of that language. I learned about it uh, sort of after I got there. Uh, but, you know, in retrospect, I think it was necessary, even though I know that in Laurel, uh, once, uh, you know, we were actually able to get a project there. And I just want to share uh, how it really began, because uh, the three of us were, we drive up and you know we had some names of NAACP members and we were trying to find those people so we would go to their houses knock on their door and you know ask them if they would like to have a chapter of Mississippi Freedom Summer 
And so it was my great fortune to have the name Eberta Spinks. And when I knocked on her door, now, you know, I am no organizer. I have never done this before. And I'm like, how on earth do I ask this lady, will you take me in? Uh, do you want a movement, a Mississippi Freedom Summer movement here? Uh, you know, it could get you killed. Uh, your house could be burned to the ground. Uh, all kinds of bad things can happen to you, but would you be willing to do it? So I'm still trying to figure out how do you ask somebody that, you know? And I'm like stumbling and she's looking at me up and down and I had on, you know, the blue jean jacket and the blue jeans, uh, which was sort of the, <laughs> the movement uh, uniform. And she looks me up and down and she says, are you one of those freedom riders? And I paused a minute because I hadn't been a freedom rider, but I thought I might want to identify with them. And I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, come on in. I've been waiting on you all my life. Now, this woman was, I'd say, in her early 50s then. And she said, come on in. And she had me to sit down. And she said, what do you need? And I said, well, initially we have, it's three of us. We need somewhere to stay. She said, well, you can stay here. My neighbor across the street, I said, they're guys. She said, oh, Miss Clayton, she'll, she'll take them in. And she said, you ready to move in? I said, well, we left our stuff in Hattiesburg. She said, well, go on back down there and get it and come on back. So that was the beginning of a project. I mean, here's this woman who is an NAACP member, but there's no groundwork that has been there. And there's no movement. She says, I've been waiting on y'all all my life. And she becomes the primary organizer. And she is able with her contacts through her churches and other groups to get housing for 23 volunteers. That's how many people eventually worked in Laurel, Mississippi. So, you know, what I've learned from that for the rest of my life is that if you can find that one person, you know, uh, you can begin organizing a community. And we went from nothing to a freedom school, a freedom daycare center, a, um, a vibrant chapter of Mississippi uh, uh, Freedom Democratic Party. Now back to what we were, you initially <clears throat> asked me to comment on. It was, we needed them to open up the state because as you've already said, I would say every week or two, the FBI came to the office and counted us. I mean, and I, you know, at that point I didn't understand that it was really only the white kids that they were trying to make sure was still alive. Uh, but, you know, they were counting and staying on top of, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing to have to say, but the martyrs, the three martyrs enabled the rest of us to stay alive. Uh, and certainly there were others who were terribly beaten and uh, possibly killed, I might not be remembering, but when the nation's eyes were turned on to the state as a result of two white men and one black man being killed, uh, this gave us organizing space that we would not have had. And Laurel, Mississippi, the head of the Ku Klux Klan lived there. And the fact that none of us were killed in Laurel is, is quite a miracle in itself. So, but at the same time, because I became the project director after uh, the uh, 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 formal person had to leave because he had been arrested, he had an outstanding warrant and they picked him up as soon as they found out he was back in the county, uh, locked him up 
And for several days, we didn't know where he was. So we thought he'd been killed. But by the time, you know, the lawyers and all were able to make the uh, sheriff uh, in Jones County uh, admit that they were holding him, they said, well, we've got him on an outstanding warrant and we're going to send him to parchment for five years. It's either that or he has to sign that he's going to leave the county and not come back for five years. So that's how I became the project director. There was Jimmy and me left and uh, they said, well, Gwen, you, you have to become the project director. You've been to jail. You know what some of this is about and you're a southerner. So, but at the same time, I went through uh, tremendous struggles with some of our white volunteers, many of whom were men. They were from Stanford, Harvard, Yale. Uh, we even had a good year tire and rubber person uh, volunteer. So, you know, we're talking upper, upper uh, wealth. And so, of course, trying to get them to understand that we are building the local leadership and you must be a part of building that. That was a tough, tough sled. And uh, I said, boy, you know, what I went through just trying to uh, deal with that, learn about that myself, as well as trying to uh, educate the white volunteers on the need for them to step back whenever there was local leadership ready to, to go forward. So it was a difficult decision, but in retrospect, I think it was the right one. I definitely want you to say more about what you referred to just now as your difficulty with white males in particular. <laughs> But, but, but put that to the side. <laughs> it has so much historical resonance, right? We'll put that to the side and we'll come back to it. I want to ask two, two questions that in my, in my head are linked, right? On the one hand, your mother and your grandmother don't want you to go into the movement. But isn't it the case, don't I remember that in their lives, they had themselves defied white power. Not only they, but your, your great grandmother who was a slave, right? Right. She had to find the power of white people, right? right. So I mean, it's just that they couldn't see what you were doing as an extension of what they were doing. So that's one thing. Mm -hmm. Then the other thing is, how do you account for Mrs. Spinks, right? What is it in the environment of that oppressive society that can produce a woman who says, I've been waiting for you all my life. Where you been, right? What, what, what shaped her? Yeah. Very good question. To go back to the first question, you know, my grandmother, I had seen her all my growing up define white racism, you know. Uh, and, you know, interestingly, in uh, Memphis, I don't, I won't swear for all of Tennessee, Black people could vote. And my grandmother was serious, as we used to say, serious as cancer about voting. And I went door to door with her. This is what was so unbelievable to me. Every election cycle, she was out there knocking on doors, begging people to register to vote. And uh, she and my grandfather, who was uh, in France during World War I, I mean, you know, so uh, they were adamant about this. And yet, she couldn't see what I was going to do, but she saw it. I, in retrospect and later, I understood that she thought I was going to be killed. And so that was what that was all about. She had to stop me, she thought, to save my life. Uh, but, and in fact, you know, over the years, as I would take her to all the integrated places and all and I said, now you know the civil rights movement did this, and she said, I know it, but I, you didn't have to do it, so it, it just, <laughs> it didn't make sense, you know. But I finally gave up on trying to get her to tell me I did the right thing. She lived to be ninety six, and she never would ever <laughs> tell me that I did the right thing. She kept saying, "You dropped out of college." That was 
a no-no for her because she wanted me to have a college education because she wanted to have one and it was never something in the realm of possibility. But anyway, to go to a Mrs. Spinks, you know, and I am so sad that, you know, in retrospect, I don't know more about her. I lived in her house for 18 months, you know, and she was an amazing person. But, you know, I don't even know her history. And I've begun, I understand that there were some, you know, interviews and things of her at the uh, University of Southern Mississippi uh, that were done years after that I have been pouring through. Uh, but I don't know. And then you had Carrie Clayton across the street. She calls her and says, will you put these two guys up? Jimmy uh, Garrett stayed there uh, for the whole summer. And she not only put him up and the other uh, brother, but she put the first office was on her back porch. Now, uh, Miss Clayton and Miss Spinks were, they owned their homes. Their homes were nicer than the home I had come from in Memphis. Uh, Mrs. Clayton had a brick home, you know, back in those days, if you lived mm -hmm. in a brick house, I mean, that was something. And she was a widow. And it's, it's terrible that I, I, you know, she was older quite a bit. Uh, and she really had a very lovely home. And the fact that she basically turned it over to us, I mean, how was that even possible? Uh, she was a widow and she was living on pensions. Um, so again, I feel terrible that I don't know more about those two women. And they, along with other women in the community, a Susie Ruffin, uh, who was already known as a firebrand. Uh, so, you know, these were incredible women who made the Laurel Project the success it was. And, and, and if my memory is right, your first office in Laurel was her back porch. Is that right? Yes, Miss Clayton's back porch. Yes, I thought I said that. We literally had an office on a back porch uh, in her home. I mean, and when it rained, we'd have to bring the uh, mimeograph machine into her living room. And I was, I mean, you know, it's, you know, she had a lovely living room and I was constantly saying, watch her furniture. Don't let any of this ink spill on the floor. I mean, you know, but she just turned her house over to us. It was, it's an incredible story. Um, and when I went back to Laurel in 2014, I was trying to, you know, learn from people. Of course, the neighborhood was so changed and many people did not know her, even though both houses were still standing. Uh, it was, these are stories that I am so sad that I didn't, we were just so busy, you know, with the work that I didn't understand the importance of those stories as well as others. But yeah, those, uh, and then we had Mr. and Mrs. Richardson to join us, or Mr. Simmons to join us. Um, and in 2014 um, at the, no, that was, I'm sorry, much earlier, we had the uh, 25th anniversary. I know you were there and we all scattered and went to our projects that we had worked in. And so a number of us did have a reunion with Miss Spinks and uh, it was in her home. Uh, and Miss Clayton had already passed as had Mrs. Ruffin, but some of the other people who had been very involved all came and we spent hours there. And you know, what was such a shock, the white mayor came, the chief of police. I mean, they all came for the reunion and you know, it was like, this would not have been possible, you know. So it was 
amazing, you know, obvious. I when I went back in 2014 and did talk to some people there who were very discouraged. Uh, and we should get into that later about the movement. They said, yes, we can vote, but our economic situation is so dire and our young people are leaving as soon as they finish high school. So, you know, uh, there, there's much to talk about, about the current time we're in and how you organize uh, around economic issues, as well as people feeling that having a lot of black elected officials had not brought the promise uh, that they thought it would bring. I, I, yeah, I want, I want to prioritize that and I'm starting, starting to worry about the clock. Yes. The reason, I, I mean, I'm, I'm asked, I'm asked a question about the influences on, on people like Mrs. Spinks, people who are ready when you got there, right? Yes. Um, because I'm going to say young, too many of the young black people I come into contact with have no sense of the roots of struggle. They don't have much sense that they, much happened before Malcolm or Martin, right? If they know Malcolm. Right? <laughs> If yes, <laughs> uh, but they don't have a sense of, of 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 traditions of resistance that go back to Reconstruction, right? And so, and I'm not, I know I, forty years ago I didn't either. I mean, I got it from talking to people in Mississippi. Neither. And, and what, but one of the themes I heard from that first generation of folk who stepped out is, my father did this, my grandfather did that, my grandmother would not go into debt to white people, my uncle would never say sir to a white man. They come from from tradition of people resisting in the ways they could resist, right? Exactly. Um, and then that is passed on to the next generation in another form. And then when the next generation does the same thing in their way, the older generation doesn't, doesn't recognize it, right? And in some ways, the, the, the movie Freedom Song, which I heartily recommend to anyone who has not seen it about the movement in Southwest Mississippi, I think that kind of generational misunderstanding is, a, is, is a, it's an important theme there. Um, as a step into connecting the past and the present, I, I want to ask you to start talking about really your own part of the project, um, the, the, or, or a part I know that had a special meaning to you, and that's the Freedom School, daycare, library, uh, the, the, the whole idea of the Freedom School, what you think it meant. Um, just anything you'd like to say about that. Oh, yes, the the Freedom School, uh, we were able, you know, with great difficulty because people were afraid to rent to us. And so a uh, fairly well to do black man uh, let us rent a building that had been a nightclub that was boarded up. So the community basically refurbished the place. Now we still had to pay him what was <laughs> quite an exorbitant amount of rent for an old boarded up building. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, everybody certainly was not about the movement. He was mm -hmm. not, uh, but anyway, so we turned that into our freedom school, our freedom library uh, and our office. And, uh, you know, this was, this was so important to the young people. Uh, I insisted on uh, teaching at least one class. I did not want to give up uh, my aspirations as a freedom school teacher. So I did have one class I taught, but we also had uh, a freedom daycare center. I don't, and we might've been the only one in another place uh, in a, a housing project uh, that had a community room and they let uh, us set that up there. It, you know, and of course, I know your involvement with the CDF Freedom Schools, and I'm happy that I've now become more involved with them during this pandemic, uh, uh, working with their teachers and all. Uh, this to me was just one of the most brilliant aspects of Freedom Summer. And it is something that I'm so happy Marion Wright Edelman and the Children's Defense Fund uh, has carried forward and going, and it's going on because it really needs to happen everywhere if we can make that 
a, a possibility. But what the uh, young people uh, learned in those schools uh, clearly was something they had not learned in the public schools, neither had I. Uh, so we were learning together uh, this history. And as you know, uh, reconstruction and all of this, you know, that we had to try to unpack. And of course, the forces of oppression and repression uh, understood the danger to uh, white supremacy and white uh, political control that these schools uh, represented. And of course, that particular one was firebombed uh, and the, uh, the fire department did not put it out. So we lost, you know, large numbers of our books. We had a library larger than the city library uh, in Laurel. So uh, people had sent just boxes and boxes of books and the young people were borrowing them and all. So that was a real setback toward the end of that summer. Uh, and we never were able to really reestablish that. So then we had to run the Freedom School out of a church. Here again, Mrs. Spinks and others, you know, made the churches open their doors for our mass meetings. Uh, Mrs. Spinks belonged to one of the larger churches, um, very nice structure. And that minister did not want us in that building. He was afraid of course of it being bombed. And she made, she got those women and they said, this is our church. We say what goes on in here. And he had to back down. So, you know, it, it's, it's incredible. Uh, to reflect back on uh, what we were doing. And I think we need it now. I mean, the political education. One of the things that I love telling students when I was teaching about the civil rights movement, here you had people who had not been able to vote, who had not been able to participate in the democratic process they took to it like a duck to water. I mean, it blew my mind. I mean, you know, when we organized the uh, Jones County chapter of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, and then, you know, people really knew because, you know, they had their churches, they had their organizations within the churches. So they had skills in it. They brought those skills to this process and they got into it uh, with such gusto. It just blew my mind, uh, you know, electing their delegates who then went to Jackson for the big Jackson uh, uh, statewide convention and then picking the delegates who would go on to Atlantic City. Uh, it, it was, you know, it really changed my life forever because I know what people can do at the local level with a minimum amount of support and resources. And in my opinion, we have failed to do that contemporarily. I mean, I'm so pleased with the Black Lives Matter, the Dream Defenders and happy to be you know, in conversation with them and working with them. But, you know, we dropped the ball, I think, around this, you know, by not organizing and helping to keep organized our communities for struggle and thinking that, you know, because we had some laws on the books and, and so-called integration that we had arrived and we were sorely mistaken. What is it? You said a lot. Um, let me, a time check, Larry. I got about 15 questions left. And I know there's supposed to be some time when uh, the audience and we take questions from the chat. So just yeah, tell me I, where we are. I'll just say we, we've still got a good, I would say, 20 minutes of conversation. But I do appreciate you uh, mentioning the chat because I just want to acknowledge a couple of points people have made in the chat. And, and Gina, who is an organizer. Like, longtime organizer said her first door knock 
Dr. Simmons' first door knock. What a hell of an ask <laughs> of, of Mrs. Spinks. I mean, it's incredible. But go ahead, Dr. Payton. I'm sorry. No, I'm, I'm sorry. We, you, you, you should have gone ahead. I just wanted to follow up on her last comment about the Freedom School to do a very brief commercial. Oh, yeah, uh, please. A, a group of us in Newark, New Jersey have been in discussion. The, the fundamental, everyone I know who ha, has had parents, organizers, who's had any significant contact with the Children's Defense Fund Freedom School, mm -hmm. which is modeled on the work that you uh, uh, and, and Schnick were doing, and also in another way on, on, on the Black Panther Liberation Schools, yes, which, were, yes. which were consciously yes. an attempt to build on, 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 on your work. Um, they feel this is what education should be like in our communities. Well, yes. Well, we're, we're trying to ask, well, why can't it be like that, right? I mean, why, why should Freedom School be six weeks, half day in the summer, right? If we agree that this kind of education focused on dignity, focused on agency, focused on activism, focused on cultural respect, if we agree that this is how our kids flourish, don't we have a right or an obligation to see that this is what school should be for our children, right? <laughs> Exactly. Now, I'm, I know I'm, I'm saying this at a time at which um, the remnants, forgive me if I'm being too blunt, but the remnants of the Republican Party are trying to just outlaw critical thinking in schools. That's about what it comes to, right? Exactly. There are some places where this conversation would be impossible politically. But in Newark, the political culture is Black and Latinx. There is no ideological opposition to this as an idea. So in, in places like that, cannot we say, look, we want some of our K to eight elementary schools, some of our nine to 12 high schools to be built on freedom school models, right? Yes. What does curriculum look like? What do family relations look like? How does organizing become a part of the school, right? Um, so we, we, we are starting that conversation. Um, we expect to have a, uh, probably in the fall a, a series of open panel discussions uh, on which we're gonna ask you to, to be a participant. Um, and so I just wanted to say that I put my uh, email address at the beginning of the chat. And if anybody is interested in being notified as these discussions develop, um, um, just email me and I'll make sure that you're on the right email list to get, to get the notifications. But I think we should push this. If this is what our children thrive under, then how do we make it more available to them, right? And so this, I just wanted to say that and now Larry, you take it away. No, I, I think that I appreciate it. That's such an excellent reminder too. And, and earlier, um, Dr. Simmons was talking about driving from Oxford to Laurel with Jimmy Garrett. And just so you, allude, both of you alluded to this earlier, but Jimmy Garrett after Freedom Summer, after SNCC, moved to San Francisco and actually enrolled mm -hmm. in San Francisco State, what was called San Francisco State College back then to help organize black students. In fact, organize black students into the nation's first black student union. Yes. And that trajectory turned into um, the first strike, the first major strike for ethnic studies, black studies, ethnic studies, third world studies mm -hmm. at San Francisco State. We're indebted, I'm indebted. I've been teaching in that, in that college for the last 27 years. But what we've done there, I think, is what in a lot of ways, Freedom Schools model too, right? Which is a relevant curriculum a curriculum that is about improving society. We have generations now of graduates in our college and our university generally, but and specifically College of Ethnic Studies, who've gone on to do organizing, to work in education, to do the kind of work that that Freedom Schools, I think the goals were, um, were, were established. So there's that connection. And then, you know, Dr. Simmons, I know you're in Florida and we've talked a little bit about your governor there and the whole kind of you know, nonsense grandstanding around critical race theory, but the actual banning of ethnic studies in Arizona and other places around the country. This is the fight that that, that continues. Um, I, I wanna uh, toss it over to Alex just real quick because so, I think Alex might have a comment or a question from either the chat or on her own and then we'll, we'll bring it back to the two of you if you don't mind. Yeah, I've definitely, I've definitely got a lot of my own thoughts. I think there's been so much important um, just important pieces in the stories that you've both shared. Uh, I wanna share a little bit about sort of myself and the work that we do, because I think it's connected to so many questions that you've already risen and questions that other folks might have as well. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm born and raised in Chicago and I grew up uh, in the black Muslim community here. My grandfather uh, was Imam W.D. Muhammad. And so I think transitioning 
Yeah, so transitioning into, into movement work and organizing um, was just very, very natural and made so much sense to me because I, I grew up in a very well-organized Black uh, Muslim community. And one of the kind of core things that we focus on in the Mass Liberation Project, which is a national organization that me and uh, two co-workers founded that focus on, focuses on decriminalization work um, at the jurisdiction level, but specifically uh, under the leadership and strategic planning of formerly incarcerated Black folks. Um, and around that, there's been just a lot of a lot of tensions, a lot of um, challenges in general. I think uh, around language, around community building, uh, around access, um, and just even like the style of how we train. We've had to make a lot of um, recent adjustments around moving into mutual aid um, to make sure that we're keeping people alive and sustaining them um, in under extreme crisis. Right? We're also talking about a body of black folks who are always under extreme crisis. Um, and there was a, the, the conversation with you all started around relationship building. Um, and I think there's a, there's been some conversations in, in our piece of the work specifically around working with white allies, right? We know that there are white formerly incarcerated folks too. Um, and we've, you know, for better or for worse, we've made the very, clear conscious decision to say that this body of work is uh, exclusive to Black directly impacted and formerly incarcerated folks, um, and that we want to be in line in alignment with right movement, uh, but that this space right does not include um, those other bodies of, uh, of folks who are directly impacted. And, and so that looks different um, place to place, uh, depending on what right what your geography looks like. In Chicago, right, we have the black, the black Mecca, right? The vast majority of our local elected officials are black folks. Um, but we know that uh, tangibly that really hasn't like changed a whole lot of the black experience in, in Chicago, especially on the South side. Um, and so, so yeah, just with all of the stories, there's so much that is um, bringing forth like my own stories about my experience growing up, um, you know, my, Unfortunately, when I became like in grade school age, Clara Muhammad School, which was named after my great grandmother, was closed. But I was raised by, um, you know, my parents who did go to Clara Muhammad School and my aunts and um, and stuff like that. And so we're we're also in the process of thinking about in the Mass Liberation Project what it look. You know, a lot of our our organizers are formerly incarcerated and directly impacted single Black moms. Um, and so we are figuring out what it looks like to um, figure out grant writing to make sure that we have childcare at all of our trainings and when we travel. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm just super grateful for this conversation. Um, the question that I do have, I know that was long-winded, is can you say more about what relationship uh, building looked like specifically with like right community folks, grassroots leaders, um, Folks, folks who were being attracted and called into, into movement, into the work, um, not as organizers. I think the culture that we have now too is right. Everybody is like a paid organizer. <laughs> um, and, and there's like a bit of a, a disconnect or a struggle to really deeply engage um, community in the work uh, to the point where community feels ownership uh, over the work. Uh, first of all, let me just tell you that uh, I now, Mr. Elijah Muhammad is your great grandfather. Is that right? And yep, I just right. want you to know that I, uh, after the Atlanta project of SNCC, or really during, uh, I joined the Nation of Islam and uh, was based in Chicago when I worked for the National Council of Negro Women, organizing women. Uh, in the Midwest and being an active member uh, in the mosque there. And because uh, I was married to another SNCC worker named Michael Simmons, his brother was John Ali. So of course, John Ali took us to meet uh, your grandfather and great grandfather. And I also had the great privilege and I will send you this information of interviewing uh, uh, Imam W.D. Uh, Muhammad 
uh, over three hours with Vincent Harding. And that mm -hmm. was an amazing uh, interview that we did with him. And I don't think you probably have seen it because it's never been published. Uh, but I do have the transcript and I will send that to you now to get. <laughs> uh, so uh, we have a lot to talk about. We need to <laughs> talk after this. You know, the thing is, is that what we were able to do in SNCC, you know, it was, it was uh, at a time when you know, people would open their doors. I mean, can you imagine? I lived in Mrs. Spinks's home and she took in two other women. So there were three of us sharing her guest room uh, for 18 months and we didn't pay her any rent. Uh, you know, we, out of uh, the, the two others were white volunteers and they didn't have an income. So they were living on whatever savings or whatever they had. And I was getting my $10 a week check before Uncle Sam took out 60 cent. So it was $9 and 40 cent. Uh, so we bought food. That was the, the contribution we made. But can you imagine living in her home, you know, every night talking about strategies and and the other thing that I always love to tell to tell my students while Mrs. Spinks was willing to follow us to jail <coughs> into hell if may be we still had to obey her I mean she meant we were going to church on Sunday and we went we had to go one no not going and all of the 23 volunteers all of whom lived in black homes, they had to go to church <laughs> if those people were church going. So, you know, we had to conform to the mores of the communities if we were going to be their leaders. So they saw us as their leaders, but at the same time, they were really in charge, you know, in some so many ways. It was an incredible kind of uh, symbiosis, I guess, between the organizers who had come from the outside and the people uh, who uh, whose communities we were the guest uh, in. Um, interestingly, when I worked for the National Council of Negro Women, I was uh, not living with the women. I had groups of women I organized in Chicago, in Detroit, in O'Leary, Ohio, uh, and Lorraine, Ohio. That was sort of my territory where I would go in. But again, when I was in the communities, I stayed with the woman who was the head leader. So, you know, it, it created a bond that lasted well beyond that project. I don't really know uh, how we can do things similarly uh, now where things are so different. Uh, we don't tend to have, you know, these uh, black communities uh, like we had then because of segregation, black people had to live together no matter what their so-called class status was. But the organizing, uh, for instance, I worked locally here with the Dream Defenders and it's been very difficult, very difficult for them to establish sort of the grassroots units uh, like we were able to do in the civil rights movement. I, I think I went off what you asked me uh, and I apologize if I did, and you, if you want to refresh, I had so much I wanted to share. <laughs> no, no, that that's that's totally fine. Um, uh, grateful for all of the things that you share. Um, yeah, the 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 question is just, can you say a little bit about what relationship building looked like during? Yeah. <laughs> well, yes. So indeed, in terms of you know living with the families um, um, now, as I. Uh, 
try to see how we can work together. How do we build community uh, within our movement circles? Uh, it is a challenge that is, I think, a lot more difficult than what we faced uh, uh, in the 60s and 70s. Um, and it's, um, you know, because here we have been working on police issues uh, locally, my local community, um, and now very involved in organizing around the 2022 elections. Um, and it's a totally different style of organizing than what I've done in the past. Trying to build uh, solid relationships is much harder. Uh, and I really rely on you young organizers as, as I observe how you all are, are doing it, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter, Black Youth Project 100, uh, which started right there in Chicago. Uh, I think we're finding our way. Uh, and I'm amazed at the progress that has been made uh, in spite of COVID and so many things that work against building the kinds of uh, community bonds in the face of the individualism of our culture. Uh, it's, it's hard and I certainly don't feel I have answers. Yeah, thank you for sharing. I do also wanna see if um, Dr. Payne, you have anything to add to that. What I will say is, I know Dr. Payne, you mentioned earlier, um, kind of one of the, uh, an area to focus, is on, focus on is around sustaining community. And, it, you know, at least us at the Mass Live Project, um, relationship building as a means to build community is one of our core focuses. And we're in constant exploration around how do we be in community together, because this is our time to practice and be creative and think about, um, and like, you know, literally be in practice around what is the type of community that we want to build. Um, and so we, we take the time to do that internally and there's a lot of growing edges and we try some stuff and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But if you have more to add Dr. Payne around relationship building or any additional thoughts around what it takes to sustain community, I'd love to hear that. I have, I have many thoughts, all of which are incoherent. Uh, first, <laughs> uh, 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 around the fundraising that you're doing, a friend of mine in Chicago, uh, uh, has considerable expertise in that area. And at some point, I'll, 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 I will put you into contact with her. Um, somebody put in the chat, uh, and I think the first name was Lisa, I didn't see it all, uh, a point, something like, organizers have to move with humility and respect. And, and, that, and, and I, I still can't improve on that, right? I mean, there's so much of that. When you talk to people about what was, what made Bob, Moses special time and time and time again. And Bob never said three words in a week. He just listened to us, mm -hmm. right? He listened, he listened, he listened, right? Mm -hmm. There is this, this story at the end of the Atlantic City Convention where, the, where they have to make the final decision about whether they're going to accept the compromise offered by Johnson. And Mrs. Hamer and all the others, well, they turned to Bob and the other stick leaders, the young and the educated. What should we do? We've never been here before. And you can see that Bob is, is, is as angry as he can get. He, but he will not make them the decision for them. He's, Mrs. Hamer, you people have to make that decision, right? Um, but, 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 but that is, again, a showing of respect. Living with people is, 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 is showing respect. Putting yeah. people into positions of leadership that they may not feel qualified or credentialed for. Is a, I've got an interview with Bob that I will send to you where he talks about the movement was a credentializing process for poor people. It gave them the right to think that they were entitled to make certain kinds of decisions, right? That school gives other people, uh, um, right? So anyway, I, I, I just, I just want to come down heavily on this showing respect. And I'm, I'm going to say it explicitly, but my students who are, who are young and wonderful and active, they have this notion of a movement as something where they get together and they talk, they come up with ideas, and then they say, okay, this is what we are going to do. <laughs> well... The broader community has not been a part of these conversations, 
right? And may have a very different set of priorities, may need to think about some things longer, right? Mm -hmm. But it becomes the, the educated activists making decisions for a community on behalf of which they are speaking, as opposed yes. to a community that they're trying to talk to and with. Yes. Um, and, and so that's, 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 that oversimplifies it, but it's a, it's, it's, yes. it's, it's, it's a part of it that I worry about. And Larry, I think you wanted to. Yeah, Dr. Payne, I, I mean, I'm glad you, you mentioned that because one of the most important parts of your book, I've Got the Light of Freedom, is that chapter on organizers. Mm -hmm. And in it, you, uh, <clears throat> you quote Bob Moses. Uh, people ask him, how are you such a great organizer? How are you so effective? And he said, you stand on a street corner and bounce a ball. Um, and you also, so I wonder if you can talk about what he meant by that. And also, if you could talk about what Ella Baker's um, pet phrase around spade work meant in that same context. Okay, well, those, are, those are soft ball questions. To quote not Bob, but Lawrence Gia, one of the other iconic SNCC organizers, you walk into a situation where, where, where people are slicing watermelons, you slice watermelons, right? You walk into a situation where people are, 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 are hauling beans, you haul beans. You don't impose your voting rights agenda you become a part of their agenda and you look for opportunities to insert your ideas when it will make sense to them. I mean, that's saying it not, not very elegantly, but that's, 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 that's what Giat was saying. You fit yourself into the situation, right? You don't just walk in and try to, try to, try to immediately change it. And so I think that's what Bob means, right? You just get into natural conversations with people. And over time, you know, the, the, the issues that you want to raise can be raised. And then people will listen to you because they think you have listened to them. Right. I think that's, that's, um, and, and, and what was the second, oh, spade work. Yeah, this is something, one, I, I love that title. And I love it because part of the way, I'm going to make this sound conspiratorial. It's obviously more complicated than that. Part of the way the broader culture de-weaponizes the history of struggle is to Hollywoodize the history of struggle. Mm -hmm right? Mm -hmm. To make it into this series of dramatic stories about these incredible charismatic personalities, all of whom were eloquent, right? Um, and change comes very, very rapidly, right? Uh, uh, and to take away the part of, you know, I always think of these organizers in, in, in Laurel, Mississippi, going back to the same house, every week for the summer with the same question, are you willing to go down to vote? And at the end, in some cases, because you've now built a relationship, the people who said no in June, some of them are gonna say yes to August, right? But nobody sees that process from June to August, the relationship building, right? The organization building, the skill building, the confidence building, all that takes months or years, right? I mean, Montgomery happened, you know, the, the bus boycott happened from between Friday and the community was, organized by, by Sunday. But the people who organized it had 20, 30, 40 years of organizing experience, right? Mm -hmm. So they could do something over a weekend because they could leverage all of those relationships. Yes. So anyway, we remember the bus boycott. We don't remember that that uh, Edie and Nixon was organizing cucumber workers in that state in the 1930s, right? right. Uh, and therefore he has a certain kind of capital. Um, and so that's the spade work. And uh, Ella Baker who, who who, who, who was just death on the so-called charismatic, often church-based leaders who wouldn't do any work, but they would show up when a microphone showed up uh, to talk about what we need to do, right? But after the microphone was gone, they were gone. And so it's, it's the undramatic, unrewarding, tedious parts of the work that very few folk are willing to do. And often these are the parts, these are parts of the work that do involve developing other people, right? Because uh, that takes forever and there's no immediate gratification to it. But you could argue that's that without that, the long-term payoffs aren't long-term. They will not last if you're not develop, if you're not building the base, which is the other part of the work. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that. Greg. Perfectly said. Way better than I could say it. It's not totally a softball question. I mean, <laughs> it's, your, it's your expertise, obviously, but it's, right. it's an important thing that we don't spend enough time talking about. Because as you say, the, there's an overemphasis on popular history of the movement that, that talks about the charismatic, the big moments, the marches, and so forth. And all those things are important. The legal victories are important. Everybody had a role. 
but the the role that organizing plays is so uh, un under considered. And so I, I appreciate both of you so much for, for shedding light. Um, Alex, do you have a, a, a thought? Um, yeah, well, I wonder, Larry, really quickly, do we have time for at least one question um, that's from the chat? Yeah, go ahead. And then I think we're going to start winding down. because We've got about okay. 10 minutes and I want to get some uh, final reflections from Dr. Simmons and Dr. Payne. Yep. Um, so we got a question earlier uh, that says, how did the community in Laurel, Mississippi respond um, to you in the beginning? What are factors, experiences that made you feel that you had been accepted? Uh, thank you so much. Great question. And again, because, you know, Mrs. Sphinx is opening the doors. So I'm under her umbrella. Uh, and these are, you know, members of the community that the people know and respect. So if Mrs. Sphinx has taken Gwen Robinson into her house and is going around with her, me, introducing me, uh, forcing her church to open the doors so that we can have what we called our mass meetings, uh, et cetera. Uh, this, you know, this is how it happened. Uh, this is how the trust was built uh, because we had people who the community knew who had embraced this project and this movement. Um, and I think, again, you know, how unique that is and how do we do it now? Uh, again, I, you know, I think that in many ways, the work that I did with the um, um, Negro, uh, National Council of Negro Women is a bit more uh, like what people are doing now because I didn't live in those communities. Again, I was given names of people and I, who were, I was told were sort of the lay leaders. Uh, and uh, I think of Lorraine, Ohio, uh, where, you know, I met this woman, I gained, uh, made friendship with her. I stayed with her when I would be in the community and she basically called the meetings at which I then was introduced and we formed groups. This happened in Chicago, this happened in Detroit, this happened in Elyria, Ohio. Uh, so that, you know, we, I think if we're outside organizers, it's very different if you live in those communities where people already know you. But if you're coming from the outside, you must establish, in my experience, relationships with people who are already seen as trustworthy, as leaders, and with them, uh, like Charles has said, you're listening to them because that was a big part of what I had to do. What are the things in uh, uh, Lorraine, Ohio that, you want to work on, what needs to change here. And so it's listening uh, and bringing humility. You're not coming in there because you know everything, you got the answers because you, that's, you're gonna shut it down, you know? So listening, uh, understanding that the people are the leaders in reality, they may, appreciate the resources you can bring, both human and others, but they are the people who decide what they want to put their energy into and how they want to get their neighbors engaged. Uh, and you are a resource to them when you are coming in as an outsider. That has been my experience. Thank you so much. Um, we're starting to get to our wind down. Uh, and so we wanna ask that the both of um, you, Dr. Simmons and Dr. Payne, uh, to offer our guests or you know, folks watching and listening and following this conversation uh, to offer an overview of your reflections on lessons from the campaign of SNCC, 
um, from organizing traditions and to what extent those lessons have informed your lives, both of, as, as activists and as scholars. Charles, you want me to go first or are you? Yeah, I need time to think about that one. <laughs> hey, I, I was hoping you wanted to go first. Well, you know, this is something, um, first of all, my involvement in the movement changed my life forever. Uh, no question about it. Um, through the movement, I really began learning about what our country is all about uh, and how we must change it so that it does become the place of the mythical, you know, America, myth America, which has never existed. And so to be engaged in the ongoing project to um, make this nation live up to its so-called founding ideals, uh, but also, you know, to bring about the kind of equality and equity and justice uh, in all areas of our life. This, this is how it started with me. And, you know, here I am uh, almost 60 years later, still on this, uh, on this working in this project uh, to bring about the change. I also learned that people are the change agents. It comes from the bottom up, not the top down. And that we live in a country that's done all it can to hide from the people, the power that they have. And so this is the work that we have to do is that uh, is to help people understand their power and their willingness to use the power to make this country the kind of country that we all want to live in. So um, this is what I learned uh, and I'm so grateful to have been in this movement to see on the ground uh, what I saw when I was 19 and 20 and 21 and, and, and to be still trying to put what I learned into place now in my seventh decade. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was great. Um, I mean, I, I came into this material, into this material much more as a teacher than as a member of the movement it, it itself, because my, my, my movement stuff is pretty peripheral. So as a teacher, what I would say is that of the things I have taught, and I've taught almost 45, 50 years now, right? The course on the movement has the biggest impact on my students, right? Uh, it has the biggest impact on my black students. And the single thing they most commonly say is that now they think differently about their parents and their grandparents, right? Mm -hmm. And I think what they mean by that is that they did not think of their parents and their grandparents in the way they think of historical actors. Historical actors are people you read about, they're important people you read in, in, in books. They didn't see that potential in their grandparents. But exactly what you learn from studying the movement is that people just ordinary black folk, right? Mm -hmm. Are the engine, they are the heart. Uh, they are the moral base of so much. When, and I wish we had more time to talk about local people as the moral base of what was going on, right? Yes. The moral discipline that they brought, 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 brought right. to so, so that's, I, I can't tell you how profoundly, when, when I said I'm in Southern New Jersey, I grew up in a series of interconnected working class black, black communities in which almost any black woman in any of those little towns could have said, we all need to meet tonight at such and such place, such and such time. And every black family would have been represented. No one needed an explanation of why you had to be there, right? Any of the black women, the women of the church, the women of the community, right? had that kind of stature and the, and the community had that kind of cohesion. It ain't that way now. <laughs> we have moved into a much more individualistic kind of, of, of uh, frame. And, you know, I play around with, um, you know, I know this is harsh, but it's, it's almost, this thing is almost over. 
Black entertainment television sometimes strikes me as the clan of our time, right? Um, the, the, the whole issue of the way in which cultural values are being undermined as Black folk assimilate into broader culture, I'm not sure that's not that, that may be the issue for me right now, right? So that's, I, 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 I will just say that. The other thing I will say, and I'm pretty sure I speak for myself and, and, and Sister Zahara, it's just wonderful to see younger folk asking the kind of questions you guys are asking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we Absolutely. don't know how to answer them. Uh, exactly. When you were age, we didn't know how to answer them either. Uh, uh, but great, it's wonderful, it's inspiring. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remember this phrase from, 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 from your friend, Rosemary Hardy. And she yes. would say it's something like, it's wonderful to see you as another link in a long chain of humanity struggling for something better, right? right. That is just, this is just a lot of fun talking to you guys. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. Well, I wanna give a just special thank you to you both uh, for not just today, but for really closing our, our Freedom School series. This was captivating, it was moving. I, I don't say that very often. It really was a gift and, and so, I couldn't thank you enough, and I hope this begins conversation and relationship with 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 all of us. We'll keep in touch. We'll we'll keep talking about what was said in the chat and what wasn't said in the chat that we need to address at some point. But I just wanted to kind of close with with um, first of all a sincere thank you, but also just a reminder that that's a story. Uh, Dr. Payne, you say the same way I say it to my students is that we we get the feedback, and it's often I had no idea about any of this, right? But even organizers who are in the work, I, I didn't know. Like the last nine weeks, we've been talking about some of these different histories. They're not the ones that get a lot of attention. So the organizing theme is 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 still critical, and maybe it may look different today, but it's still critical. And I still think it's about some of those themes. Um, I want to throw it to uh, Alex in just one second, but I want to offer a few acknowledgments, and then I'm going to let Alex close. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Simmons. I just want to uh, make sure, and I will send this information to you to please share with everybody. Uh, you know, we do have a SNCC legacy project oh, and we're true. having the 60th anniversary a year late of uh, the founding of SNCC. It will be virtual and uh, we have, you know, discounts for students and organizers. And so I just want to put that on your agenda. It's October 14th through 16th. And I'll send you all the links for that. Yeah, I, I thank you. you. You you stole my thunder. I was about to get into that because I, I want to oh. also thank Chute Allen and, and Bruce Hartford mm -hmm. with the Bay Area Veterans of Civil yes. Rights Movement and the SNCC Legacy Project um, and the 60th anniversary. Yeah, you all were robbed of the 60th last year. So that's coming up again this year. Right. That's great. I also just want to real quick thank the Spade Work and Freedom School team, um, recognize our founding team, uh, starting with Francis Calpatura, who's always in the background, Lisa Castellanos, and of course, uh, Ale and Ada today for, for interpretation and my great co-host uh, Alex Muhammad. I'll throw it back to Alex for a close. Yeah, thank you so much too to, to the entire team and to our guest speakers today. Uh, very grateful for this conversation and thank you to everybody who's been um, hanging in there with us for the past 10 weeks and engaging in conversation, showing up, um, sharing your own experiences and then also to our participants in spade work. Uh, our next generation of organizers on the front lines. Um, I really do, I, I don't wanna undo or mince words with uh, the last words that you shared, uh, Dr. Simmons, around just the importance and um, the life-changing experience you had in organizing and how it is very much deeply a part of who you still are. Um, and, and that has also been my experience with organizing. It's not something that you just kind of put down at the end of the day or when you clock out of work, right? Organizing um, is my community, it's my friends, it's my work. Um, and so I'm also super excited and inspired to, to see every week um, more and more folks either in organizing, trying to learn and figure out how to get better, how to sustain themselves in the work. Um, and then, right, others who, who are curious and just wanting to figure out how do they get started? Um, how do they get involved? So thank you all for showing up and participating. Um, just a quick word from our sponsors. Uh, this is the end of our Freedom School program. This is our last session um, for, for this year. But if you've been inspired by the sessions and you wanna keep the work going in the future, please go to the link that's gonna drop in the chat now and make a donation. Your contributions will go to develop organizers through spade work. 
Um, and like I said earlier, Spade Work is a new national organizer training program to nurture the next generation of organizers of color. Um, and, uh, and we've had many uh, participants in Spade Work that were engaging in the chat. The question that I shared is from uh, one of the organizers that's in the Spade Work cohort. Um, and so, yeah, I just, uh, I also wanted to share this one thing because spade work and some of the stories that were, were shared reminds me of something that my father used to always share with me. He loves to garden in his spare time. Um, but he says like, if there's something wrong with the vegetables that you're growing, you don't go tinkering around with the vegetable, you check its soil. Um, and so that's like the work that we're doing in spade work, right? It's a, a long process of tilling the soil to create the world that we all deserve to live in. So thank you all. Um, Larry, did you have anything that you wanted to add? I just want to say thank you again to everybody, our audience. Stay safe, be well, take care of yourselves, take care of each other. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.